So it reads, uh, if an amino acid is dissolved in water, actually maybe would it, would you just like me to switch to that screen? Would that be more helpful? We can do that. Okay, so uh, right here, AB3, if an amino acid is dissolved in water, the pH of the solution is adjusted to 12, what's the predominant species? So, um, and look, you don't even have to deal with a side chain on this. What a joke. So, um, you would just need to remember typical PAs for, for the amine are 9 or 10. Typical pKa's for the acid are about 2 to 3. Uh, so at pH 12, everything would be expected to be deprotonated. So we are looking at the one that has the most deprotonation. A has the amine deprotonated, but not the acid, which makes no sense. B here has everything protonated, so that would be at like pH 1. C has uh, is is kind of our neutral one where we have that's around pH uh, that would be the isoelectric point or you know uh, physiological pH and part D everything is deprotonated we have a non-positive amine and we have a negative carboxylic acid so um, that one we're looking at uh, D to be the answer there. Hooray! So that's one example of amino acid type stuff um, let's see, let's scroll up. Where else might we find amino acids in this lovely book? There's not really much in terms of, since this does most mostly focus on chemistry, chemistry, um, the amino acid synthesis that we looked at was more kind of like esoteric examples of how to use reactions we already know to make amino acids. Um, and they're all kind of crappy anyway, so um, biological systems are much better at making amino acids than chemists are, so um, it's, it's not really that relevant, I would say. All right, so on this list, anything we'd like to go over? I had a question for the Eno this chapter. Yeah, let's do it. 91. Okay. Is it the chapter in here or the chapter from that I linked uh, earlier? Uh, not from that book. From this book. Um, yeah. 91. How did I go that far? All right. Uh, do you remember which question it was? Yeah, I'm trying to find the... I'm trying to go to the page right now. Okay. Number five. Is it like the the one where they they walk practice. you through it or the practice quiz? Oh, it's practice. Okay. Practice. Yeah. All right, number five. Let's have a look. All righty. So, which one of these is going to have the greatest concentration of the enol tautomer? Sorry, can you zoom in a little bit? Because it's kind of hard to see. All right, so we're looking at number five here in the top right. So, which of these is going to have the greatest concentration of the enol tautomer? So, um, so of course, the enol tautomer would be, instead of having a ketone, you would have a hydroxy group on a, a double-bonded carbon, right? Um, so we're looking at which one of those is that double bond going to contribute to the stability of uh, of the molecule as opposed to having the ketone. So looking at them, we have a couple of, of good options, a couple of bad options, right? We have, hopefully we can say right now that one of these should... Uh, be just thrown out the window right away. Which one which one is like completely garbage here as an answer? Oops. Oh, 
sorry, I just opened it twice. Okay, hold up. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, which one did you say? I said D. Yes, D, and because D, of course, there's no way to make a tautomer there because there's no acidic proton. Uh, you can't make a double bond on that carbon because it already has its uh, four bonds. There's nothing to remove to uh, to make it any better. So, D's out the window. All right, so we're left with with two options, or with kind of two major options here. So we have uh, option uh, A and B, they've got two ketones, and option C has a benzene. So if we're looking at those, if we um, take a look at the ketone ones, we have A and B. Is there going to be anything different about A and B. If we make, like, if we make an enol on both of those, what, what's the difference between A and B, just the ketone ones? And then we'll look at the benzene. It's closer so they can have the resonance with it. Or Which like... one's closer, did you say? A. A is closer, right. So uh, if you uh, make a double bond between this alpha carbon and one of your ketone containing carbons make the other one an OH, you end up with a conjugated system, right? You have a double bond O, single bond, and then a double bond C with an OH on it. So you're, you're ending up adding conjugation to where there was conjugation, no conjugation before. That's a good thing, right? With B, as, as Narek has pointed out, if you make an enol on either... Or, Either one of these ketones, well, one's an aldehyde, the other's also got an aldehyde, um, doesn't really matter. Um, we're not going to end up with a conjugated system. We're going to have two single bonds in between our double bonds, so not conjugated there. With C, if we make uh, the, the enol on the other side, we will end up with a conjugated double bond, but we already have conjugation as it is with our benzene. Our benzene is conjugated with the carbonyl, the C double bond O, uh, and it would equally be conjugated with uh, the enol version of this if we made the double bond uh, to the other carbon there. So what we're looking at is we, we make conjugation here, we do not make conjugation in these other two. Any new conjugation that is. C already is conjugated, so there's less of a driving force, but A is not conjugated, but it can be. And remember that conjugation is a pretty stabilizing force, right? So we're looking at the one that's going to give us the most new stability into our molecule. So C would add stability, but it's not new stability, it's just changing stability types. However, A is going to empirically become more stable if it forms the enol uh, version of it. So uh, A is going to be our answer here. So, so what were you thinking, Narek, when you were looking at that question? I was stuck between A and C, but I couldn't. Right. I yeah. So the one. difference is we have no conjugation to now we have conjugation versus C, we have conjugation, and then we also have conjugation. So C is going to be more stable regardless, but that's not the difference. We're not looking at which one of these is more stable. We're looking at the, each individual molecule, seeing if it is more likely to exist as an enol or as a ketone. So, um, so in this case, we're looking at A because we're adding stability by making an enol. Um, and then, do you look at like um, the positioning of the available hydrogen too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's why, like D, we can't do anything with it. Um, so, Same yeah, and with B, because what you're going to end up with here, I can switch screens again. We can, um, we can draw out the enols of these, uh, ba -ba 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 discord, change windows. Okay. All right. So we're switching here. So let me, let me draw these things. Okay, so we have 
I'm going to just draw A, C, and D because we don't care about the rest. And this one is two carbons away. So if we're going to make the enol form of all of these, uh, it doesn't really necessarily matter which one we, we take off. Uh, ideally, we'll, we'll end up with a more substituted alkene as well. That's generally a good thing. So that's another factor that can come into play here. So if we look here, we've got a lot of good things going for this particular one. We have conjugation that's introduced plus we have a tetra substituted double bond. This one is not conjugated, so it's going to be less likely to form. And then the other one is conjugated, but the ketone was also already conjugated, so we're not adding conjugation in. So the reason that this one, the, the top left there, option A, is, is the best is because we're adding conjugation by making it into an enol. Uh, with the, the benzene one, we are not adding conjugation. It's already got four conjugated double bonds. We are now just switching the type of double bond. We're switching from an alkene to, or from a ketone to an alkene, uh, but still conjugated in either case. So there's not a driving force necessarily to make that change, where there would be for A. We're going from non-conjugated to conjugated. That's a good thing. Conjugated to conjugated, who cares? Uh, and then we can also say this is a di-sub double bond. So in either case, we're, we're for two reasons, we're going to see that uh, this one is is particularly stable as an enol, and so it is probably more likely to form that enol as a result. So, Narek, does it help also seeing the double bonds drawn in there as well? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it makes, it makes a lot more sense. Cool. Okay. Any others on that question or other questions we can go over? So, uh, I had a question on exam one. On exam one, okay. Uh, yeah. Let's well, go. I'm not sure how the ACS will format exam one problems. Okay. Um, what was the content of exam one? And what, what's your, like, because we can just find the corresponding section in the ACS guide here. Yeah. So we can look at well, that. Well, it, it was more like number four. On the exam one. Can you just and, describe number four real quick? Yeah. Um, it was de determined the major product of the reaction below mm -hmm. with appropriate regio and serochemistry. Yeah. Which, which, uh, was it just one of them? One reaction? Yeah. It was just one reaction. Was that the Diels Alder? I th yeah. Okay. Great. Then let's take a look at, uh, okay. Um, where would Diels Alder be hidden under this thing? Probably under electrophilic additions. Okay. Um, let's let me swap this thing screen over again to the ACS guide. Okay. Well, let's just let's see if that'll work. Nope. Okay. So let's check out uh, electrophilic additions. That's page fifty-nine. Well, it's um, it was specifically page sixty-five. 
65. Oh, well, why didn't you just say that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, 65, you said. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, so, um, oh, 66. Okay, which one are we looking at? Yeah. So it was more to do with problems 1, 2, and 6. 1, 2, and 6. Okay, let's take a look at those. All right, so... All right, so number one, uh, not necessarily deals alter. This is a 105 reaction, right? Uh, this will be hydration of an alkene that we're looking at here. And so when you see those reagents, you have an alkene and you've got acidic water. Uh, that is one of your 14 alkene reactions, right? Um, so this one we're looking at making a carbocation and then we're going to add an OH to that carbocation. And so we just have to think where that OH is going to end up. So uh, remember the double bond is going to go after the uh, H plus, it'll go after a proton and then it'll have a carbocation on a tertiary center. And so um, it looks like B is going to be your best answer right off the bat. Doesn't look like there's going to be a migration because we're already going to be at a tertiary carbon. Uh, if we go ahead and uh, do this as an as a Markovnikov addition with a carbocation on it. So, um, do you want to look at the mechanism or like what what kind of was? No, I guess it was just seeing where it went because I for, I didn't know if it was good. Like tertiary spot like D or so well the problem with D is we somehow have moved a methyl group over and added and moved a hydrogen over somewhere else right which is <laughs> unlikely for carbocations there's only I don't want to say two but there's three real rearrangements that can happen you can have a hydride shift that happens if you're at primary or secondary and there's a tertiary nearby uh, right next to it um here let's let me switch back to the other screen so we can write these out um ba -ba -ba -ba. okay switching to this screen now okay um with carbocations rearrangements we have the hydride shift this will happen if you have a primary carbocation next to a secondary or tertiary position or a secondary carbocation next to a tertiary position. Those are the, the two criteria to make a, uh, a, carbo a hydride shift happen. So for example, if you have a carbocation here, it will move one spot over. So it will move a hydride and it will move itself to the more stable position. So this would be a primary next to a secondary, so it's going to move. Uh, this one now, this, this secondary one, is not going to move anymore because it's already the most stable it's going to be. So there's no reason for it to move. If you have a secondary one next to a tertiary one, you will get it to move as well. So now we have our most stable one. So hydride shifts can happen in, in one of two circumstances. And in both of them, you're just moving up your uh, substitution on your carbocation. It has to be adjacent. If it's primary, it's next to something that's either secondary or tertiary. For a uh, secondary one, it's got to be next to a tertiary to migrate. So those are the two conditions for hydride shifts. Um, for uh, methyl shifts, those are going to be primary or secondary carbocations that are next to quaternary carbons. For example, 
you were going to end up moving a methyl group over as well as your carbocation and now your carbocation is on a tertiary position so that is more stable um, and so uh, if that was where your carbocation was you can stabilize it by moving a methyl group over if you had it on the other if you had it on a primary carbon Again, same thing, you can move a carbon there, and you can have your uh, carbocation be on a tertiary position. So um, these are the, re the more common rearrangements, one we can predict. So it should also be noted that this, there's no adjacent tertiary position. For, for this methyl shift. Uh, it's a lot easier to move a hydrogen than it is to move a methyl group. So if you have a tertiary position nearby, if you are on the secondary carbon, you are not going to do a, a methyl shift. You're going to do a hydride shift. Hydride shifts are preferred. So in this case, you're not moving a methyl. You're going to just move a hydrogen. And you're going to end up with predominantly just moving over the hydrogen, moving your carbocation over. So um, with a methyl shift, you're looking at a primary or secondary carbocation that is next to a quaternary carbon. Quaternary carbon has four carbons attached to it. Um, option three is a ring expansion, but these are not predictable. So I would just not even worry about ring expansions because they are, they can happen, but they are difficult to predict when they're going to happen. Typically, you're looking at something that has a very small ring, three, four membered ring nearby a carbocation, it can expand. Um, but it also depends on the type of carbocation you have. If it's already tertiary, are you going to expand? Probably not. So it's, uh, it's just not predictable. It's great for mechanisms. We can say show a mechanism to do a ring expansion, but if you're just given a product and be like, okay, well, is this thing going to expand? Probably not. Or, you know, even if it's on this primary position, are you going to get the expansion or are you going to get it just moved to the tertiary position next door? Who knows? You would end up with both. You can either hydride shift or ring expand. So giant mess. That is um, tough to predict. So I would not worry too much about ring expansions. All right, so in this case, we're looking at this thing is going to grab a proton, it's going to form the carbocation on this tertiary position. It's already the most stable it can be, it's tertiary already, so there's no reason for this thing to go anywhere, so it just gets attacked right on that same position. Um, the only other kind of even considerable Answer for, for that question was A. Um, that would be an anti-Markovnikov hydroxylation. These are not the reagents to do that. It's not likely to happen that way. But that would be the only like, other reasonable answer. C makes no sense because you're doing a substitution on an allylic position with an OH. That's weird. And D, you have somehow moved a methyl group and a hydrogen. So... Uh, very strange things happening in D. So uh, most likely is, is, is going to be B there. Okay. Okay, and then so you said, uh, what was the, the next one you said? Was it two? Number two, yeah. All right, number two. So these are, I'm going to just write the question out here. 
Uh, so we have cyclo methyl cyclohexene, and we've got oh, they're using the dimer. What are these reaction conditions for? What's the name of this reaction? What may be helpful is to remember that this is two BH3s that are put together. Remember that BH3 forms dimers with itself, uh, unless it's got THF. Is it a hydroboration? It is indeed a hydroboration oxidation. Um, and so, this is the interesting part. So this is hydroboration oxidation, right? If we remember what that means, if we want to think about the uh, regiochemistry, this is anti Markovnikov hydroxylation. And in terms of stereochemistry, this is a syn addition. So we're looking at a product that gives us a hydroxy group on the less substituted side and we're looking for it to be added in a syn manner. So we're adding our uh, our hydroxy and our hydrogen to the same side. And so we're looking at which one of those is going to give us uh, this as our answer. So the anti-Markovnikov composition is the bottom one, right? of that alkene. So we're looking at we're looking at this. And if we want to think about stereochemistry, this is a syn addition. So we're adding the OH and the H to the same side. So we're looking at these two things to be opposite to each other. The methyl group and the hydroxy should be the opposite of each other. Uh, and or we could get the enantiomer. So let's look at the products and see which one of those uh, would correspond with this. So option A has them trans to each other, which is what we have in our prediction, so that looks good. Option B has them cis to each other, the methyl group and the OH, so probably not. Option C is a Markovnikov addition, so that's a no-go, and option D has uh, two hydroxies, so <laughs> we're not looking at that one either. So our answers come down to A or B. Is this a syn addition or an anti addition? Remember, we're adding an H and an OH to this, and this is a syn addition, so we're looking for H and OH to be on the same side. Or if you want to think about it, the methyl group and the OH are on opposite sides, either way, uh, and so that should be A there. And hopefully, that's the answer in the back. So um, remember that with, with every kind of reaction, especially for the alkene reactions, you want to know where it goes and what's the stereochemistry of it. So what's the functional group? Where is it going to go? Regiochemistry. Uh, what's the stereochemistry? Is this a syn addition or an anti-addition? Or is it just no relationship? So um, hydroboration oxidation is a syn addition. Okay. Hopefully that helped with that one. All right. So let's look at six then. For six, yeah. I was wondering um, what type of reaction was it? That is uh, oxymercuration of an alkyne. So you're going to end up with a, a um, an enol that's going to tautomerize to a ketone. So let's take a look. This oh, be... now that since you said that, I kind of get which ah. ones. Ah, yeah. okay. Well, for everyone else who's here, we can still do it, I suppose. It's a good review. 
Um, ba -ba -ba. That is a triple bond there, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Okay. Um, and then it's an ethyl group. All right, we are treating this with water, sulfuric acid, and mercury two sulfate. We want to remember that this is going to be a um, this is a kind of Markovnikov. I say that in quotation marks because Markovnikov is really for alkenes. This is not an alkene, but we'll do it anyway. Um, it's a, a, a hydroxy addition. Followed by tautomerization. So uh, we're going to want to put this on the more substituted side. It may not be super obvious here. Um, so we're going to want to look at our, our product options. Really, we're looking at B and D. Those are the only ones that give ketones, right? And we know that um, once we add the hydroxy, we, we have an enol. So we need to determine if the enol is going to be on this side or if it's going to be on the other side. We've got our ethyl group versus the uh, benzene part. Uh, and so, with this, the products that we get, we end up with a conjugated ketone in one product, and we get an unconjugated ketone in the other. So, what's more likely? The top one, the conjugated. Presumably the conjugated one, right? So, uh, so that would presumably be our answer. And so it should be a D there. We'll give you the, the conjugated ketone. Uh, yeah, and that's the answer. So, um, a lot of these, it seems... There may have been some uh, forgesh, forgeshen. Uh, <laughs> what the hell's the word? What's the noun form of forget? Forgetting? I guess so. Uh, there has been some forgetting of your uh, 105 reactions. So, yeah. Uh, definitely, you'll want to bust out your 105 flashcards from when, when, who knows when. If not, remember on my YouTube channel, I do have videos for all this stuff. Um, if you want to look there to refresh your memory. Worst case, uh, you know, like there are sites that just have figures that have all your alkyne reactions, all your alkene reactions. Um, and so they may be helpful as well. All right. Eric, were there any others in that section you wanted to go over? Or anyone else? I guess 14. All right, that's fine. 14. Ho, 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 we have a deals all there. So, all right. I'm going to copy the question over. So, So we have a Diels-Alder reaction that's going to be happening here. Um, and so perhaps we remember uh, Diels-Alder chemistry. Perhaps not at all, but we can go ahead and go over it. So um, remember Diels-Alder is a cyclo... Um, it's a cycloaddition reaction, so we have... Well, technically speaking, we should attack that one first. Really, there's no difference on which side we're attacking um, because um, we're going to be, uh, it's symmetrical. Both of these are symmetrical, right? Our diene and dienophile are both symmetrical. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and have this uh, react. So these two here are now going to be connected with those two from our 
dieno file. So typically for these things, remember we, we draw them as as these kind of three-dimensional structures. These up these are your purple carbons up here, out of the way. We know that we're going to form a, a bond between the blue carbons. Those are our new bonds. And we're going to have a, a new double bond back on that side. And then we just have some CNs going uh, on this thing. Um, and so we have to consider uh, where these cyanides are going to go. They should both... Uh, presumably go down. However, one of them will probably have to go up because they're on opposite sides of the double bond. Um, so, just because they're trans to each other. So there's not really a difference in endo and exo product here. But we're looking at something that's going to have this uh, bicyclic structure with the double bond as well as the, the two cyanides on it. So, um, oh, this is a weird option. Look at that. Oh, I guess that's showing it's coming out, but still down. That's weird. Okay, well, uh, option A here is, is, as you can see, what we've drawn as our product. So that's a good thing. Option B has an extra double bond. Option B would be if we took the following. If we did this. That would be the product that would give option B. So Deals Alder does not put two double bonds and you end up with one double bond with a regular Deals Alder. Uh, C and D kind of don't make sense because uh, we were going to end up with a bicyclic system here, not a... Um, uh, God, what is this word? I mean, those are bicyclic too, but we're going to have a bridged bicyclic. All right, so if we start with a ring, we're going to make a second ring. And those rings are going to be like weirdly at angles to each other. Um, so uh, just remember that if you're, one of your starting materials is a ring, you're going to end up with a bridged bicyclic compound. Um, you're not going to end up with C or D. Uh, though you could end up with C or D if you had things that were not rings to begin with, at least not on your diene. So... Um, so C and D are not likely to happen here. So um, hopefully that, that helps that out. Um, this is something that a model would be useful for as well. If you had something just like, like this, this is where you can end up with these weird double ring systems. Because your diene is not in a ring. Um, because what's happening here is you're forming a new ring on, on your diene. So if your diene is not already in a ring, then you can form one. That's when you'll form these, uh, something like that. You would need your diene to not be in a ring. If your diene is in a ring, you're going to end up with a bridged bicyclic. Because that's where the new ring is made. All this stuff, who cares? Our group. So that doesn't. That's not going to add weird things to your structure. So um, we don't have to worry about those as much. It's when we have our dying in a ring. That's when we get a bridged bicyclic. And a bi-bridged bicyclic, that's this part, the bridge. The like it's it's two rings that are kind of 3D messing with each other. With um the others, those C and D do not have um a bridge. And so um that's what we're looking for with this one. Alright, so does that help Eric? Yes, yeah, so more commonly than not, it's going to be more of the drawings like A and B. Yeah, those are because typically we use cyclic dienes because they're locked in cis conformation already. 
Um, remember that something like this thing will just rotate around and it's unlikely to be cis. And remember, we need S cis for deals alder to happen. But something like our rings are always cis, so they're very reactive. Very easily undergo these reactions. So, uh, so very often, yeah, you will see cyclic ones. And as a result, you will see bridged bicyclics as products for deals alders. And the main reason why it's not CRD is because you don't, you're not adding a, basically another ring. Well, so there are two rings here, but the point is because this one is not in a ring already, you're oh, only right. going to end up with like, I don't want to say two dimensional, but you're not going to end up with this bridge in between the two rings. Like you're not going to be sharing more than two carbons. These rings only share two carbons. This sort of ring shares four carbons. Uh, the, these four carbons are shared with both rings. So you do have two six membered rings, but they're sharing four carbons. And one of the, and you see a bridge there. That's that three dimensional part that sticks up. These other ones only share two carbons. Uh, and so you don't have a bridge. And so you can draw that as planar if you want. This one you cannot draw planar uh, because you, you are sharing four carbons instead of two. Okay, thank you. Yeah, hopefully that helps. Okay. All right, next. So, um, are there any particular sections that you think we should focus on more, or is it all kind of equal? Pretty equal. Okay. Yeah. That's the way they do it, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let's scroll back up to the sections here. So, um, let's see. I would say, however, the structure hybridization resonance stuff is, and the acid base stuff, stereoisomerism, spectroscopy, and redox, those things, and maybe free radicals also, those would be more 105 type of reactions. So those may be. Uh, less familiar to you right now so you may want to make sure that you go over those in particular um, because we've a 106 is mostly um, nucleophilic additions at carbonyl groups or substitution at carbon carbonyl groups enolates uh, aromatic substitutions and and kind of synthesis right those are the big topics we covered in, in 106 105 stuff may not be as familiar to you so you may want to review that more because as you see like it, it's just all throughout you get everything so however if you've magically kept up with all your 105 stuff then I mean, it's, it's all over the place, so. Alrighty, what next? I had a question on, uh, page 55. Alright. Uh, PDF is 55. PDF 55. Makes it easy, I can just type it in. Okay. So, like, NS, whatever? Yeah, okay. number six. Uh, NS6, okay. So, um, I'm gonna... Okay, I'm just gonna show this one because uh, it'll, it's a long thing. Um, change windows. Okay, so swapping to that. Okay, so uh, what is the... Oh, let me move it to the screen recording side as well. 
What is the order of rates from fastest to slowest for the reactions of these of three nucleophiles with propyl bromide? Um, so generic reaction here, we are forming uh, a substitution. We're kicking out a primary bromine and replacing it with a nucleophile. So we're looking at, the only difference here is we're looking at different nucleophiles. So we want to imagine which uh, of these is going to be the strongest nucleophile followed by the weaker ones. So let's consider what makes something a good nucleophile. Ideally, we want a localized negative charge. Um, and other than that, um, we're looking at the one that is um, most capable of uh, using electrons to attack something. So as we see, we have three options here, right? The, the, the three options are all the same, but we have to choose the order. So we should hopefully identify right away that our methoxide ion of these three is the strongest. Hopefully that part makes sense. It's the only one that's got a negative charge. So it's going to be the most nucleophilic right off the bat. So that means we can get rid of A and B right away. Because if we're looking for the fastest one, that's going to be the most reactive nucleophile. Most reactive nucleophile is your negative, the one that's uh, most negative, right? So the methoxide wins. So we have to consider between now the amine and the alcohol. And so, do we remember what the, um, um, what's its strategies for this are going to be? What happens when we uh, do that replacement? What do we end up with? When we take uh, either the amine or the alcohol and add it onto our molecule, we end up with something that's cationic, right? When we attack and kick out the bromine, like if we attack bromine with water, we end up with OH2 plus as a substituent, a protonated alcohol. And if we think about a protonated amine versus a protonated alcohol, a protonated amine is more stable. Amines are more basic than alcohols are. Uh, and therefore, amines we should expect to be more nucleophilic. Because they're better at, at taking that positive charge that they're going to get before they get deprotonated. Um, and so amines in general are more nucleophilic than alcohols are. So uh, we're going to go ahead and understand that. And so um, we're going to have uh, option C is going to beat out uh, D there. So hopefully right away you can eliminate A and B. Hopefully that's that part's okay. So it comes down to C or D. You have to consider what's a better uh, nucleophile. Uh, and amines are better nucleophiles than oxygens are. And I think this paragraph, let's see, nucleophilic strength is the same order as base strength. Yeah, right. So, um, so of course, nitrogen is a better base than oxygen is. So uh, we're looking at that. All right. So uh, what? talk to me about this question. What was uh, What was giving you trouble on this one? Uh, yeah, I'm just going to figure out, like, after the negative charge, like, okay. which one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, if you want to think about the, um, switching back to the tablet here. All right. Apparently we're doing this in red. If we do the same thing with uh, an alcohol, okay, let's not use red. What we end up with is 
is the following. Which one of these is better at accommodating a positive charge, the nitrogen or the oxygen? Nitrogen. Nitrogen is right. Um, because it's less electronegative, therefore it's more electropositive, it's more likely to stand that positive charge. So that's one reason that we can reason through this thing. We also know that uh, these this thing, you know, once you deprotonate it, it's done. It's done reacting. Ethers are non-reactive, right? You typically don't do more things with ethers. However, we know that with more of this bromine, this nitrogen is still nucleophilic once you deprotonate it, it will in fact later go and become, it'll become a quaternary ammonium eventually. Um, so we, we know that nitrogen is a more active species as a nucleophile than oxygen is, if we think back to our amines versus ethers. So a secondary amine even a tertiary amine can still act as a nucleophile. However, we do not see ethers behaving that way. We don't see ethers as nucleophiles very often. We in fact also see something like an amine can still be a base even if it's tertiary, whereas we don't see ethers acting as bases. we still see tertiary amines still acting as bases. And that tells us something about their lone pair. The lone pairs on the oxygen are not reactive compared to the lone pair on the nitrogen. So that nitrogen, remember acid-base stuff, bases uh, you were, are technically nucleophiles, right? They're attacking a proton. Proton is an electrophile. So, um, Amines are much better at being bases than uh, than oxygens are, or ethers, or or alcohols. So um, we're going to see that that's that's the reason there. So we we have evidence in all the reactions we've covered uh, that show that nitrogens are more nucleophilic. So hopefully that'll help uh, make that more clear to you. Yeah, that makes so much sense. sense. Thank you. Alrighty, cool. Alright, what next? So you've already saw the exam? Or the fun? Yes. It's on so... campus for you already. You can't access it yet, but it is there. So I have assembled it, yep. So you chose the more 106 than 105, I'm assuming. <laughs> Next. <laughs> so I was um, wondering from the first beginning chapters where we did like the orbital stuff i don't know if it's on the acs let's see um let's let's take a look at this um i don't remember let's see uh where's the electrophilic additions I don't know if something like that is covered on this sort of exam because of how long these things tend, to, or like the questions tend to be. Um, I'm not seeing any in the practice of this, so it's probably less likely. Um, but is there anything on? that particularly you'd like to go over 
about Malachi? I was just wondering if, like, how the, any sort of problem like that would be on the final. Because, like, which mm -hmm. node or how many nodes does this have, stuff like that. Okay, well, I can tell you right off the bat. Am I still showing the um, tablet? I don't even remember. <laughs> Yeah, you are. Okay, you. okay, okay. For for figuring out nodes and that sort of thing, that we can go over. That's pretty easy. Um, depending on how many p orbitals. Well, count the p orbitals involved. And remember that there are two p orbitals per double bond. And since we're looking at conjugated systems, we're looking at at least four p orbitals, right? So something like that would have four p orbitals that we're looking at here. Um, and so nodes will always be between you'll have either zero nodes anywhere from zero to your number of p orbitals minus one. So, example here, we have four p orbitals. So, we're going to end up with four molecular orbitals. One with zero nodes, one node, two node, or three nodes. So, in this case, p is four. So, we have between zero to three number of nodes in our molecular orbitals. Um, if you had 12 orbitals, you would have 12 MOs, assuming these are all conjugated. Uh, you would have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 nodes possible. So you'd have 12 different molecular orbitals, one molecular orbital has zero nodes. All of them are all connected. One of them will have one node that's right in the middle. And you just keep breaking it up uh, as you go. So um, thinking out the number of nodes that are possible is just the number of orbitals minus one. That's your maximum number of nodes. Um, and And so... I don't know what type of question might be asked uh, without giving anything away. So, um, for something like this, it's it's generally pretty... So, something that has zero nodes is usually the most obvious. If you have one node... If you have two nodes... You're going to end up with three blobs. And then with three nodes, you have discrete orbitals at that point. So um, you always want to divide them as evenly as possible. Um, in this case, you know, we, we had two options. You typically want them to be symmetrical as well. Uh, Remember, this is kind of really more... It'd be better to draw it as that. Sorry. Uh, where we have two of them shared in the middle. Uh, we could have done it a different way. We could have done it bum, bum, bum. That would be okay as well. Uh, that would also be two nodes, but it's typically more common that you see them symmetrical. So very often we'll see this one over that one. Where... Um, where you have your two nodes and there, there's the biggest one in the middle. Um, I'm not sure what else to, to talk about with this in the amount of time we have. Um, does this at least help with, like, number of nodes that you could have. 
Yes, it's just okay. minus one. Minus one. Up to minus one, yes. So, um... Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. There's a lot to go over there, so... There's another video you can watch, yay! Just a quick question, is the ACS, like question-wise, is it starting from beginning of the semester to end of the semester, or is it just all randomly mixed Random. Up? Have fun. Yep. So, it'll be completely random, and yeah. So, you might start off with spectroscopy, and end up at resonance or something, and then have all the Windows 6 in between, who knows. So, fun stuff. The question, question is going to be all on the same, same page, page, or is it going to be like all the same? One yeah. question. Yep. Okay. Because almost all of them have images with them. Um, in order to just like help the loading process, it's easier to have them all at once. So um, it'll be just like the practice in this regard. So um, I would. Definitely make sure that on the practice exam you can see all the pictures of the molecules and all that stuff. So, like, double check uh, that that your computer is capable of doing it. So. And then would it be curved as well? Depends. I can't predict the future, so we'll see. Practice final uh, mixed questions, or is it just the same? Uh, you mean like the, the which questions are on that practice final? Yeah, um, like, uh, if you retake it, it's just going to show So, well, maybe. Um, because I I have eight questions for that question bank, and I have it drawing seven from those. So there's a potential you could get one question swapped out if you take it again. So, And none of those are ones that are actually on your exam. So I took those out of the pool and used those. General speaking, that's the practice final. I guess it's just gonna look like the final, just different questions. Yeah, just one tenth the length, 10% of it. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, I think he's gonna be telling you your hopefully, he'll have your exam gra or um, lab grades done by tomorrow. Um, and I'll give you feedback, although it's kind of too late at this point. I mean, I don't understand, like, if he's going to be like, well, your lab report sucked or whatever, and it's like the end of the semester. But uh, he is going to be talking with you all tomorrow about that. So, um, yeah. I'm not sure when he's going to send the grades to me. Um, hopefully I will... Uh, have finished grading exam four by the time he sends those, so you'll have all the information there, and then I can uh, decide about cutoffs and all that fun stuff. Alright, anything else we'd like to go over? Let's see what the memes from Eric are. Yeah, that, that is that is Eric's life. Yeah. Oh, 
All right. Well, if there's nothing else, um, that's it then. Hooray, we have survived, kind of. Uh, for those of you who uh, did get the zero on the first exam, uh, and then after the final, um, I'll send out instructions uh, to what you guys are going to do uh, to have that uh, replace your, your lowest grade. Or your uh, the zero, sorry, which is your lowest grade. Um, so uh, we'll we'll have that later. Uh, so, but I'll do it after the final, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, and then we'll we'll figure that out. Okay. So that'll come uh, especially for y'all. Alrighty. Um, yeah. Thank you, Professor. This was fun. Hooray! Hooray! Yes. Yeah, the channels that was entertaining <laughs> good that was the point say again Ramon oh like super entertaining I love the memes and all the pet pics good good yes that's the point so hopefully it makes it a little bit less uh, scary <laughs> when we're in here so very good then alrighty well, will there be, uh, will there be any office hours uh, today or tomorrow yeah what is my 12-15 uh, yep I will be here. Okay. So thank you. Uh huh. Alrighty. Well, it's been fun all. We've all cried through the Meisenheimer complexes together. So um, hooray, we're done. That's it then. So um, best of luck on Wednesday, as well as on whatever other finals you may have. Um, and yeah, so we'll we'll see once I have all the information. You don't gotta message me like, hey, what's the curve? All this stuff. I'll let you know when I figure that out. So um, so just just be patient on that. Um, I will also let you know once they send out the email. Um, they'll tell us when grades are due, and they will also let us know when y'all can see your grades on, um, my GCC. So, like, stuff on Canvas, like, the school doesn't see that, right? So they have no idea what the percentages are or anything. So all I submit is a letter. Um, and so I will make those letters visible on Canvas, and you should. I'll let you know when you can see them on my GCC. Um, and if there's a discrepancy, then you can let me know. Uh, like, if I accidentally put the wrong grade, if I accidentally gave Eric an F, um, you know, accidentally um then let me know um but you don't gotta be like hey i'm at the borderline whatever you know I, i'm already pretty generous as it is so if i make the cutoff 86 or whatever just throwing that number out there i don't actually know what it's gonna be don't be like i have 85 where's my a you know i i choose these cutoffs uh for a reason so um yeah so just be aware of that. Uh, I'll let you know what's going to happen uh, with, with adjustment-wise. Okay? Awesome, then. Enjoy your last two days of torture. Uh, and, well, I guess you have other classes, so maybe you'll still be tortured for them. But at least my torture will be over soon. So, All right. Enjoy oh, thank them. Thank you for your Uh-huh. And I'll see maybe some of you at, at uh, 12, 12, whatever. So, alrighty. Thanks, Thanks for, for making, making the torture, torture at least fun. <laughs> <laughs> you are welcome. <laughs> All right, take care, everybody. I'll come to the office. You've got all this time to do it now. Did you choose to do it then? Okay. Well, there's that. Okay. Bye. Bye.